Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, <laughs> not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, he was on a one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. And his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. And then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. And his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had the mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. <laughs> Friends, let us begin with prayer. Let the words of my mouth and meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It is great to be here, my friends, on this side of the pulpit. Thank you, Pastor, for creating this opportunity to preach. As uh, Pastor Farrell uh, said, I'm often traveling to churches within our synod and serving the wider church in our area in my role as Kirby Smith Associates, serving churches and Christian nonprofits and Christian schools as we help to raise and steward gifts given to the glory of God. Next week, though, I get a bit of time off for good behavior. I get to visit my parents in Maine. Yeah, it's going to be fantastic. <coughs> now, this past summer, we got to have a mini family reunion in Maine. We were able to align the planets and the stars and family schedules. And I got to actually gather there with my sister and her family and my family. And we were all able to spend time with my parents before we launched back into getting kids into school or starting kids back into their days of college or getting our heads reoriented into our fall schedules. And while we were sitting around my parents' dining table, my sister and I were laughing at all of our old jokes and songs that we made up when we were kids. If anybody has siblings, you know, you, you, you tell some joke and 25 years later you're still laughing about it. Or you come up with some song in the middle of the night because you can't sleep and, you know, the dog is making strange noises. And so you make a song about that and then 30 years later you're like, oh, remember that song? Oh, maybe it's just my family. I don't know. Anywho, as we were just engaging in all this storytelling, I looked over and I could see tears in my dad's eyes. Now, they weren't tears from the exquisite stories or the really cheesy songs we kids created, but rather they were tears of joy. You see, there was a time, not so long ago in my family's history, that the mere idea of sitting around a table sharing laughs and stories seemed unrealistic. In fact, there was a time that I did not know if we would be gathered around any table on this side of the kingdom. Because there was a time where words were hurled at one another and lines were drawn, family visits 
cancel, phone calls refused, and if there was communication, it was limited and tense. Like so many families, there was a time that it seemed like our family was broken, cracked into several pieces that we couldn't even imagine holding a conversation or sharing laughter or exchanging a hug or an embrace. Somewhere along this strange journey called life, a communication cancel. There's a family member reaching out to another with words saying, I'm sorry. Things have changed. Can we begin again? I've missed you. And from that one moment, new pathways of possibility were ignored and renewed. That's the power of compassion and forgiveness. What seems dead and lifeless and impossible through confession and forgiveness becomes alive once again. That ritual of confession and forgiveness is essential to our very being because from the very beginning of life, we run into missteps and we have hurts and hang-ups, and we lash out in anger, and we lock up our hearts. When we talk about forgiveness, I think it might be tempting to look at big world events like Israel and Palestine, Russia and the Ukraine, or political arguments in our own country. And yes, much confession and forgiveness is needed in those areas. But where the need for forgiveness really touches us personally, is within our own communities, particularly our own families. Today we heard the tail end of the story of Joseph and his brothers. Maybe you know that one where Joseph gets a really fancy coat from his dad, and his older brothers are like, Joseph gets all the best clothes, <clears throat> and they're jealous. And then there's jealousy and anger takes on new levels when Joseph starts having dreams about how they'll all bow down to him. Man, Joe. Kind of cut it out, man, you know? <laughs> He's getting your brother's really mad at you. And like all families, there's a backstory. You see, Joseph's dad, Jacob, had two wives. One named Leah, who he was forced to marry, and one named Rachel, who he always wanted to marry. And Jacob had ten kids from Leah and other servants, but with Rachel, he only had two, Benjamin and Joseph. And Rachel died early. So guess who Jacob favored as the son? <laughs> guess who Jacob showered with more attention and love? And eventually the brothers get rid of Joseph by selling him. And many twists and turns later, and Joseph is in the upper management of the Egyptian government, and it's his brothers who come to ask him for help and forgiveness. Now at this point, Joseph has a decision. Does he return tit for tat? Is there an eye for eye involved here? No. Joseph forgives. But what does it look like? Well, he says something pretty profound. He says, don't you see? You planned evil against me. But God used those same plans for good. Well, that's not to whitewash what happened. To say that there was some dysfunction in their family is a bit of an understatement. But Joseph is choosing to look at how God used this situation to bless others. Because Joseph is now in a position of authority where he could save countless lives by providing care and protection in the face of famine. This is a point where Joseph could easily throw his brothers in jail, sell them into slavery, or even execute them. But he doesn't. He forgives them. And from that point on, these brothers go from being separated by favoritism to becoming family. And from there, they would become 12 tribes of Israel. Without this moment of forgiveness. Who knows what would have happened to the children of Israel. It's all about forgiveness. So what is forgiveness? Well, at its heart, forgiveness is a restoration of relationships. It's releasing any claim on someone else for some past 
self-defense or injury. Forgiveness cancels relational debt and opens up a future that we can't even imagine. That's why it's so important. So very valuable. When you think about your family or this community, do we just mess up one time? No. Usually when we sin against each other, from the childish, he pulled my hair, she took my toy, mom, to the more serious, he lied to me. He rejected me. We do this forgiveness act many, many times. This is why Peter asks Jesus the question, well, <clears throat> how many times? And through hyperbole and parable, Jesus responds, don't keep count. It's not the quantity, it's the quality. Think about those two servants in the parable we heard. In U.S. currency terms, one owes $100,000 to the master. He can never pay. He knows this. He begs for mercy and is forgiven. The other servant owes the first one $10. That's a drop in the bucket of debt compared to the 100000 the first owed. And we expect the first servant to be generous and kind. But what does he do instead? He gets stuck on a measly debt. He lashes out and pays the price in our parable. Now this parable gets me thinking about how money and debt issues can really inflict tension, especially in families. Money can bring about these types of fights, can't they? But there's something more here. Why couldn't that first servant get past that small, insignificant debt? Why couldn't he see past it? and live into that ridiculous mercy he got from the king. Why was he so short-sighted? Why couldn't he live into that grace that he first received? Why do we do the same? Why do we focus on someone's petty little slight, their little debt, their snub, when it's really a drop in the bucket? Have you ever heard yourself get really mad at something that's not very big in the grand scheme, like, she stole my spot in the parking lot, now I have to walk 20 extra feet to Giant, how dare she? That's never happened to anybody else, and I'm, and I'm just the most petty person on the face of the planet, I could be. Uh, confession and forgiveness is good for the soul. When's the last time, though, that you really tried to patch up an important relationship? Really patch it up. Not just say, I'm okay, I'm just going to be passive aggressive about this for the rest of my life. But like really, really say, I want to be better. I want us to be better. Let's be better together. But don't forget that place that we have to start at. Sometimes our failure to forgive keeps us in the cycle of just bad stuff. Our unwillingness to let go of a, a number on us. It, it just hangs next to us and weighs on us. It's like we have this heavy baggage that weighs us down. When we fail to forgive, we take it with us wherever we go. When we hold on to things, when we fail to, to let it go. We're the ones being tortured. The anger, the spite, it gets to us. And it adds up. Sure, it starts out with one thing or another, but when we hold on to them, when we don't let them go, it becomes this terrible weight that we can't carry. We're tortured by our own unwillingness to forgive. This is why Jesus invites us to rest, to lift us of our burdens, to let the sins, the debts, the snubs go. We have received unfathomable amounts of grace. We can't begin to count God's mercy. God looks at us and could see us as sinners, as petty ingrates who 
rather than saying thank you, just want more. But rather than looking at us as the worms that we are, which is Martin Luther's words, by the way, God looks at us and sees love. God looks at us and sees the mercy of Christ and what we can be. And our debt, our completely unpayable debt, is wiped clean, gone. So what if we together as a community listen to God's invitation today? That thing that you're holding on to. What if today you let it go? What if you let that baggage go and be free of that burden? What if you free another of the burdens that they sinned against you? Imagine how lighter you might feel. Imagine those tears from Jewel rather than tears. 